Welcome to Discussing Fitchburg Now. I'm your host, Sam Squalia. Tonight on our show, we're going to have, for the first half, we're going to be talking about the Lemonster Emergency, the Lemonster Emergency Department expansion at the Lemonster Hospital of uh, UMass Memorial Clinton. And on our second half, we're going to be having the MLK Coalition coming on and talking about their 19th annual MLK celebration in Lemonster. So for our first half, representatives from UMass Memorial, we have Alex Weil and Deb LaPointe. You do? Alex, you are the, the chief of emergency medicine. Yes. Right? That's correct. All right. Great. So the, the Lemonster, the emergency department expansion, right? Yeah. This is a this is a big expansion. This is a forty million dollars I read in the paper. Is that right? Just about. You know, it's we. Um, it's been way overdue. Years overdue. We've been start, stop, start, stop, and now we're going to start, and it's really going to happen. Mm. It's a thirty-seven point three million dollar project. Thirty-seven point three million. Yeah. yeah. So it will include expansion and renovations. Mm -hmm. uh, we currently have twenty-four beds. She'll correct me if I'm wrong, and we're going to thirty-seven beds. And uh, you know anyone that visits the emergency department right now knows that we're we're just packed to the hilt when it comes to patients coming in the door. So uh, the space is very much needed, and, and it'll probably take about 30 months for the project to be completed. So we're really excited about that. So it's a it's a very large project, and it's going to take a, a a fair amount of time, a mm -hmm. couple of years. And the impetus for this was you the the wait times. Is that is that correct? Correct. A large amount of volume of, of patients. At some point, um, you just run out of space. And no matter how much you, um, you know, make things more efficient, if you don't have the space, you just can't bring more patients in to be seen. So there comes a point where you just say, we, we've got to do something. We've got to create more beds. And uh, we've been saying, hey, we need to do this. Um, the patients are, are, you know, behind us, and the hospital's behind us, and we're looking to hopefully um, get all the funds we need to not only make it a great place, but also improve the patient experience as well. How long has uh, renovations been currently underway? So, you know, we, we, we were overachievers this year. And October 1st, we started the expansion of the emergency department. We merged with Clinton Hospital, and we activated what was called Epic Go Live, which was that as a system, we went from about 126 different software platforms down to one. Oh, it so was, different departments were using different coding yeah, systems? Not just us, Clinton Hospital, Memorial, Marlboro Medical Center, so all of us did this go live October 1st. So that's when we really started at least the, the preliminary uh, preparation. So if anyone has been to the emergency department recently, they've noticed that we've had to relocate the ambulances to lobby B. Mm. Yes, um, there's signs directing you to go a different way for the ambulances. Yes. So you can no longer get to the emergency department from McKay Street, which is on the back side. Um, you certainly could, there's a walkway, but we, we just don't think that's great for folks, especially if someone arrives and they're sick. We want them to go to Lobby B. And so that's, that's the first step, which was that we needed to move the ambulances because that's where the expansion is first going to happen. We're going to push the wall out um, and add more rooms on that side. Uh, we do have You're going three. out and up. We're Correct. going out and up. We are. Um, the at Lobby B, we have free complimentary care. Complimentary care. Oh my God! <laughs> Just the day I had free complimentary uh, valet parking. Oh, I've heard about that. Good, yes, gotten good reviews on the on social media. Oh, good. Well, we want good reviews. Yes, for sure. exactly. Well, we were thinking, you know, um, this this is a multi-stage build, right? Um, and we're. When we uh, designed the new emergency department, we kept that in mind. We wanted to keep as many beds open as possible during the build because you can't shut down the whole emergency department. So each stage um, is going to take a specific part, either do the build or do the renovation. And what we've tried to do is minimize the number of beds affected in each stage. 
This first stage um, is more of the build out, and so that affected more of the through traffic. Mm -hmm. uh, the valet. So you still have your 24 beds running. Currently, right. This first it's stage. It's more how you access your department. Mm -hmm. Correct. And so the valet was, you know, one of the ideas we had. Um, we don't want our patients having to walk, you know, this great distance. You have a issue with, you know, a breathing issue or a heart issue. We mm -hmm. certainly don't want people mm -hmm. having to walk. So the valet was a great idea. And that's we a free happy. service. It is. Mm -hmm. It is. And so, you know, Dr. Weil's been talking about the expansion and the addition of rooms. We've also put money into the technology, and maybe you could talk a little bit about how we're standardizing the rooms, how important that is. Oh, I saw there was a cardi some special cardiac unit for every room. So currently, um, the way our emergency department is set up is that some of the rooms have the capability of cardiac monitoring, meaning, you know, being able to see what's going on with the heart, lungs, you know, how you're oxygenating. And these monitors are unfortunately not available in each and every room because when we built the emergency department, the initial thought process was that we'd have one section all for quick things. Mm -hmm. And we didn't need those cardiac monitors. Well now, as our volume is increasing each and every year, and quite quite a bit recently, um, we are now finding that we could use these monitors in every room. Because you'll have a patient in one room that doesn't have a monitor, and you realize that you need to take this reading, and now you gotta find a room that has it open, and... Right. right. Yeah, and then right. there's waiting. We don't or, want any waiting. Yeah. We, we want everyone to get treated and get the right care at the right time. And so the the other piece of this, which is part of the campaign, is that we are expanding the behavioral health section of the emergency department. So, you know, right now we see between 47,000 and 50,000 visits a year in the emergency department. Of that... 50,000 visits? Yes. We're a little busy. Projecting, yeah. Of that, for uh, seven thousand or more can be behavioral health. Now, visits. when you say behavioral health, does that also include drug overdose? So when we, um, it might eventually. Um, our, uh, you know, drug overdose is initially a medical issue, mm -hmm. right? So you've got to make sure that you know they've been medically stabilized and that everything's safe in order to go to the next step, which could be at that time. Um, we always offer screening um, at this point. We, um, there's an obligation actually, it's, it's um, by law A now. mental health screening. Right, we, okay. um, so if somebody comes in and they've overdosed, uh, it is up to us after we've medically cleared them and stabilized them to offer them a mental health screen. Um, and that mental health screen is, Screen, uh, screening is directed specifically at that issue. It's not um, necessarily off in you know another area, but it's about um, you know uh, abuse, uh, you know overuse, uh, depression, other comorbidities, etc. And so um, this is a way that you know they um, may transition into our mental health uh, patient uh, area, but not everyone takes us up on the offer. So a, a large portion are mental health coming into the emergency department. Correct. They are. Yeah. Now is this, it, uh, it, can you give me some examples of, of why someone uh, with a mental health uh, would have a mental health emergency? So some of those can be things like, for example, um, uh, somebody who self, you know, reports, I'm having issues with depression, I'm afraid for my own safety, or it could be in the form of somebody's actually tried to harm themselves, or it could be in the form of uh, a neighbor, a bystander, someone notices abnormal behaviors that could be, you know, concerning. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, it presents in different ways. Mm -hmm. but so it's like 10% or 15% of your total volume well, is, is, up, is It's been as high as 20% of the volume. Behavioral health? Is yes. That, yeah. That's and health. now, uh, what sort of, um, infrastructure do you have for a behavioral health unit area? Is so currently, different? yeah, currently right now, um, when, again, when this emergency department was designed, it was back in the day when there were more, um, there were more areas uh, outside, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, there yeah. were areas outside of the emergency department that um, maintained, treated, 
took care of our behavioral mental health patients. As those places and the beds available have diminished externally, the emergency department has now become the area. It's like the main hub? Right, it's where people can go for care. So um, the, the hospital, the emergency department, wasn't designed to have safe rooms. Um, we have a couple now and we've worked with what we have, so but. A room where you can't harm yourself? Correct, no. correct. Mm -hmm. We have them, but they've been a development over time. Um, with our new emergency department, there is a specific area that we've created um, for our behavioral and mental health patients. Uh, all the rooms are safe rooms. Um, we also have things like showers where um, people can, you know, have their private area right now. Unfortunately, that wasn't built into our emergency department and some people are having prolonged stays waiting for their bed at, a, you know, an inpatient psychiatric facility. And so those waits can sometimes be days. And this is, so you know. So people stay multiple days in the emergency department. Sometimes they, they do. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we have to make that better for them mm -hmm. um, and this build will do that it'll make the experience better for them and it's it's an important thing to do because it's hard enough to be in there waiting and then to not be able to you know have warm meals have a shower have you know the feeling of safety and all of that because again you know we just didn't have this in mind when our emergency mm -hmm. department was designed and built years and years ago. So when you built the Urgent Care Center, that was a, a UMass Memorial project, correct? Down um, by Marshalls? Yes. Yep. So was, that, a, was a part of that goal to, to uh, help alleviate the emergency load? Well, you know, quietly we were hoping that that was the case, but it absolutely <laughs> is not the case. It didn't. It, it didn't mitigate the issue at all. Really? And, um, the, uh, the numbers continue to grow and the numbers at the Urgent Care Center continue to grow. So, you know, we're happy about that, but it, it did not impact the emergency department at all and honestly uh, you know if I'm correct me if I'm wrong on this but once they come into the emergency department we own them so you know if we're busy and they've walked in and, and we've you can't say oh why don't you just sorry, go to just, urgent care right, yeah right. We, we you know we want to treat them so you know the volume has really been a challenge um, you know we feel like we've got some really great staff that are trying to do some really great things and give quality care but now the expansion will make it more comfortable for patients hopefully the patient flow will be better the space will be more open um, the main lobby is going to change a little bit so again when you walk into lobby b where the the elevators are mm -hmm. the telecom operators they're not actually receptionists they're our operators that are answering the phone they will relocate to another area so now that space will have couches and chairs for people to relax and um, the you can have a coffee shop and yeah, I, and I'm going to have a coffee shop. A fancy gift shop. We're having a fancy gift shop. The, the guild is very excited to move downstairs to the main lobby with their gift shop and all windows. So, um, you know, everything's going to be open and bright and feel comfortable and welcoming. It yeah. will. It will. In fact, if people go to the Health Lanes Foundation website, there is a video that'll, a 3D video that'll oh, take them the, through. Oh, of the, of uh, the, like a 3D yep. design. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yep. and here, and here we go. Oh, okay. So, yep. This, and this is what the front of the hospital will look like. So, on the left side with the turnstile, that's the entrance to the waiting room area for the emergency department. And is this where uh, ambulances come yep. in? Yeah. Uh, for now, it is, but. Um, Oh, oh, there we go. So all the way on the left-hand side, you can't see all the, oh, go all the way to the end. That's actually where the ambulances will be parking. Okay, once it'll expansion be, it's office done. picture. It's over here yeah. right yeah. now. This is correct. You're correct. This is the area right now that we're utilizing. So there'll be some, like I said, the stages will have, you know, various changes. There we go. Mm -hmm. So yeah, all the way on the end is where the ambulances would come in. And what, uh, what I was really pleased to see and hear is that we really took the time to work with the EMS personnel and the, the nurses in the ED to get their feedback as to what works, what doesn't work, what should be where. You know, so something as simple as the ambulance is parking all the, all the way down at the end, but having to, um, you know, roll a cart or, or a bed all the way down the hallway to get to the nurse's station, was that a problem? They didn't, they didn't see it that way. They thought that was fine. Okay. Um, they'll have hazmat, uh, you know, area to decontaminate down there. They have office space. At the ambulance area? Yeah. yeah. That's, you always want that at the um, entry. 
So uh, just in case, for example, you have an exposure, you want to be able to do all your decontamination before you bring it through your whole entire emergency department. Mm -hmm. So those two, um, when you make a new build, um, that is the you know standard now. Uh, so do all the ambulances come through a hazardous uh, so, like a like a decontamination? So th or just th when it's um, not when you're notified that there could be. A a Correct. Right. There is a um, right now the way we are built. If we, you know, are concerned with that, if the call ahead is saying, "Hey, this could be, you know, an exposure of some sort," then we have a way to bring them in through our decontamination mm. uh, area. Uh, the way this will be built right now is it won't seem like you're going through anything special, but it will be right there and available. So, I read that uh, you will be having state-of-the-art resuscitation rooms. What is that? So currently, um, we designate certain rooms as what we call our trauma or resuscitation rooms. And those rooms That's tend same, to be. the same thing as a trauma room. Correct. Oh, OK. Yeah. Those tend to be, you want a little bit more space because when you have a full you know, trauma, there's not just one You person might have multiple in the room. doctors doing multiple, multiple doctors, things. Multiple doctors, multiple technicians, multiple nurses. You know, you can have, you know, Something going on at the head of the bed, something going on at the middle of the bed, something going on the and, the, so this, and these this are all. This is where things. you bring a um, accident, car accident victim, Correct. or a gunshot victim. Or Mm -hmm. Yeah, or somebody having a cardiac event of significance where, you know, they have an arrhythmia and you're trying to stabilize. And this is the unstable patient. Um, so what's so, changing from your current resuscitation room to your new resuscitation rooms? We're changing some, uh, a fair amount of the equipment, um, how it's set up, how it's located. As you can imagine, when seconds count, if something is a minute away, it actually makes a difference, right? Um, so at this point, with the way we're configured, we can't put everything that we need at our fingertips. We've got to have things in other areas. Something so simple as our ultrasound machine mm -hmm. can't be kept within the uh, trauma bays, and those are essential to traumas nowadays. Um, so these bigger rooms um, with better design allow you to have everything at your fingertips. And again, seconds count. Mm -hmm. So um, the design and the space uh, makes for a better resuscitation. All right. Are you going to keep, be keeping the same amount of staff, or are you going to increase your staff? You know, uh, your number of doctors, or is mm -hmm. it just the space that's getting more efficient, or are, are we getting more people? So we will be upstaffing as those beds become available because you know right now it's like limited seating uh, in an auditorium and it doesn't make sense if you just put more people on the stage. You know you got to increase the seats, but once the seats increase, then you want the stage to increase to give the better experience. So we'll be uh, having more providers and our hours for those providers, and we'll also be changing. And it looks like the parking lot expanded. We've added several parking lots, and we still have some parking challenges. Yeah, hence the valet. Yep. Yeah. So we we added the valet. We've added 60 parking spots um, on the corner of Chandler Street and Hospital Road. On McKay Street, we have employees parking in a 27 lot uh, parking lot there, and now we're adding one behind the Simons Building. And you know, we're re we're really trying really hard to make sure we're opening up the spaces for our patients and their families. Um, and you know the employees are certainly cooperating to go into the, the outskirts of of the parking areas. And um, I think I just want to mention too too that you know with the whole expansion of the emergency department that we are looking for community support. Uh, we've launched your fundraising. A, my fundraising, yes. We've mm -hmm. um, launched a 2.5 million dollar campaign. And you know, I feel like most, if not all, of it is really around the whole behavioral health challenge for us that we. Um, want to keep that behavioral health team. We have some specialists in the in the emergency department to address it. Mm -hmm. um, so funding would go towards that to support behavioral health services, which is, you know, vital in this community right now. You touched on the opioid crisis and mental health, and it just continues to cripple us as we are challenged with it every day. So. Um, I would appeal to your listeners that they can go to the foundation website if they want to make a donation. You know, anyone. What's that's the foundation website? 
healthalliancefoundation.org. Healthalliancefoundation.org. Yes. Very yep. great. And I would say, and you know, as she's been talking about anyone that's been in the emergency department, unless you were very lucky to be when it's very quiet, you see how hard the nurses work and how important it is for us to expand the space for them and for the physicians so that they can do the work that they want to do. So, you know, so you're trying to raise $2.5 million, mm -hmm. and, a, um, and a large portion of this is going to, to benefit the behavioral health services um, doctors So and, behavioral and health navigator, case management. You know, a patient comes in and they, they give us our consent to help them. You know, old school was, okay, Mr. Smith, you know, you have an addiction problem here, some references, or referrals, go and call them, they can help you. Well, we don't want to do that anymore. We want to give them wraparound services. Like recovery services. coaches? Do, yeah, do it could be recovery them? coaches. You know, the, the thing is what I'm learning is, and she kind of alluded to this, is that the majority of the people that come in are probably dual diagnosis when you, when you get down to the bottom of it, that they're dealing with the mental health issue and they're self-medicating with some sort of a substance. Mm. So peer recovery coaches are awesome. They do a great job. But we also want to keep in mind that they may need case management. They may need some counseling. Um, the family m might need support. Mm. So it comes down to, you know, building those wraparound services, and most of them are things that the hospital wouldn't do. So we're collaborating with partners in the community to make sure that we, we make that happen. So, so you might have a space that uh, other organizations from the community can come in and provide services like recovery coaches or that kind of thing. Yeah. What other organizations are you working with? So the collaboration when we started the program, and it was, it was called CHART, which was um, financed or, or funded, I should say, by the Health Policy Commission, which is Health a state. Health Policy Commission. Yeah. Uh, a state agency and we got 3.8 million dollars to really um, build this program in the emergency department and so some of the other collaborators are the Community Health Connection, mm -hmm. AdCare, um, CHL, CHL, yeah, Community Health Link, Community Health Link, yeah, Luck, um, you know, Mock, uh, we, you know, we try to work with any of the local agencies that can Fitchburg Family Practice, our residency program. So, you know, any one of those we may be calling. Um, the Fitchburg Police has peer recovery coaches. Mm -hmm. We're now working with clinicians from the Lemonster Police Department in the city of Lemonster. Every town in, in this region has an opioid task force. Yep. So, uh, you know, we are it Sounds really like a really great community service. That yeah, the, this that you know the UMass Memorial is providing here. It is. I mean, we've both said it. it's going to take a community response. We we can't tackle it on our own. Mm -hmm. So you know, an improved facility for the physicians and the nurse you know caregivers will be great. So are you doing other fundraisers than just uh, soliciting money on the website? Yeah. So we're going to do the speakeasy again this year. That's the first Thursday in March. Is this the second speakeasy, or how no, many years have you been be doing it? No, this will be the. Yeah, they're going to kill me. The 11th. 11th. 11th, yep. Nice. Yep. Um, and then the golf tournament in August. Both those events, the, the money that we raise will go towards the behavioral health program. Um, the rumors are we're going to bring back our gala in the fall, so mm -hmm. uh, we'll, we'll see. But and well, you can find out all this information at the website, which is? Healthalliancefoundation.org. Healthalliancefoundation.org. And there it is right on the screen. There you can see oh, there right we go. There. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Great. And, um, you know, and then the community has been very supportive. We're already two thirds uh, to where we need to be for the goal. And what's the timeline of the goal? Well, 30 we, months? We, yeah, <laughs> so we'll, we'll probably go another 12 months with the campaign and then wind that down. Our, our physicians have been extremely generous. Our senior leadership team has all stepped up to the plate. We're getting ready to do an employee campaign. And that's all important because I'd want the community, the community to know that we, the employees of the hospital, see this as being really important. And that's why we're supporting it. Um, so. You know we're 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 well on our way, and um, I, you know I, I my, the CEO will tell you I'm not going to take no for answer. I'm going to get to the 2.5 one way or another, so I'll figure it out. But oh yeah, it's all good. I I believe it. <laughs> I have faith. You have faith. It's okay, so um, in the beginning you had said you you've done a lot of things starting in October, and you also merged with Clinton Hospital. So now, I know you have a very long name now. It's like UMass Memorial Health Clinton. Alliance Clinton Hospital. UMass Memorial Health Alliance, Health Alliance Clinton, Clinton Hospital. Hospital. Yes. So your Clinton Hospital is remaining open. It is. And uh, is that expanding in any way? And, and how do you connect the Lemonster campus with the Clinton cam campus? Do you want to talk about transitions? So um, currently, you know, the 
emergency departments have been, you know, operating independently. Um, now we have our nursing director is overseeing both of them. So what we're doing over these months is um, sort of merging uh, the services in coming up with, you know, policies that are now um, the same for both sites because when you take two different EDs the way they function you know policies are sometimes completely difficult mm -hmm. uh, different because they've you been have, doing it this way forever mm -hmm. correct and you know the um, a lot of that has to do with what the hospital itself offers as services on the other end um, so at this point now with us merging um, they are considered just another site um, and so we have the ability to have patients be admitted to either site and depending upon you know what the diagnosis is what is the most appropriate facility on um, Clinton Hospital. So when they're on the way they, they call and you can say oh go to Clinton? Uh, it doesn't work quite like that but once the patients are in the emergency department say for example um, they have a diagnosis of a process that we know is very well managed at Clinton Hospital if they're at Lemonster what we can do is we can offer them a Clinton hospital bed when we don't have any available at Lemonster mm -hmm. which is great because nobody wants to sit in an emergency department in a hallway for waiting for a hours. bed. Oh yeah. we're, we're or, lucky sometimes if that's six hours oh, if there's wow. no beds yeah. you know mm -hmm. and um, uh, Clinton Hospital has some of the highest patient satisfaction scores in the area, if not the highest at this point. Um, it has a lot to do with their nursing ratio to patient, nursing to patient, um, and uh, so they uh, they deliver the more a great one, one service. Attention, the better. It's yeah. great. It's you know, so it's an alternative. It's a choice. Um, some patients are appropriate for that facility. Some you know will have to stay at Health Alliance because we either offer a specialty that's not available you know at that campus. So we consider them a campus now as opposed to an independent a campus, right? Mm -hmm. Is Fitchburg the Burbank campus uh, is. part of the campus? So that's a campus. Yeah, that is campus. And what is going on in Fitchburg? There's a lot going on in Fitchburg. So um, as we kind of alluded to, we've got the Fitchburg Family Practice. That's and the, the Community that's Health Connections. And Community Health Connections, yes. And Community Health Link is also there? Is uh, right? They are. They're on the second floor of the Cancer Center, mm -hmm. um, which has a lot of space up there. And then, of course, the Cancer Center is there. Um, urgent care and we have our complementary care um, all up at Burbank so you know we're looking at options to build that campus up and add more services which is all part of the whole strategic plan when you think about the Clinton campus the Burbank campus and Lemonster is you know we have so many different services do we have anything that's a duplication of effort would one service be better in another location um, and you know we have a space issue so we want to make sure we take advantage of every space that we have uh, so we, you know, it's a because we just merged in October. It's a work in process, but yeah, yeah. continuing on that. Yeah, more to come. <laughs> more to come. All right, great. So, uh, is there anything else you'd like to add before we cut to a break? I think we covered it. I think that you know, it's it's nice to have confidence in your community hospital, and I think that our new emergency department um, will enable patients to be seen faster, um, will have better uh, and a, a better experience to offer, um, you know, higher and more improved technologies, you know. Uh, every dollar that we get means we can look into something new, different, like anything that you know we can do to to make the care we deliver uh, better is better really what we're looking for. Better care and better satisfaction. That's and those two things are right. so important. Right. All right, great. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Um, our Health Alliance members, uh, Alex Weil and Deb LaPointe. You got All it. Right. Thank you. So thank, much. You. thank you. Okay, so us. we're going to cut to a break and then we're going to be discussing the MLK Coalition and Celebration. Welcome to FATV, Fitchburg Access Television. 
Each week, we take pride in providing some of the best public access television programs in New England. From FATV live sporting events, city meetings, and school functions, to weekly shows such as Barbara and Youth, Inside and Discussing Fitchburg, Sports Weekly, Weekly Wellness, and Our City. Our dedicated staff of industry professionals and hard-working volunteers is here each week working behind the scenes, making it all happen. Besides on air, our programming is also shown live online, where you can see our shows in beautiful high definition. You can also search through our archive of past shows and watch anytime at your leisure. But did you know you can also be part of the action? Become a member of FATV and you gain access to all the equipment, studio space, and classes that FATV has to offer. You can create your own show, volunteer for exciting live events in our studio, or all around the city in our high quality mobile broadcast truck. The possibilities are endless. For a small fee, you can become an individual member. Or for a little more, you and a group of friends can become part of a rising trend in the future of television. From sports shows to news shows, civic events and talk shows, you can be in the driver's seat by directing and even starring in your own production. Also, students are free. FATV staff can assist you by getting your new show up and running with professional industry standard equipment, TV studio time, and private editing suites. All you need are friends to help out, and before you know it, you will be on the air. So if you have a great idea for a TV show and want to share it with the world, stop by 175 Kimball Street, Fitchburg for a free tour of our facility. You can also contact us at 978 343-0834 or email us at info at FATV.org. Fitchburg Access Television, working together for a stronger community. Welcome back to Discussing Fitchburg Now. We're, I have uh, members of the MLK Coalition here with me now. Yeah. Linda Mason, Tom Ferrazano. Yeah. And so the MLK Coalition, that's a, that's a Lemonster, Fitchburg, Gardner area group. Yes. Right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, so we're going to be, you're going to be doing your 19th annual celebration for Martin Luther King Jr. Yes. Dr. Yeah. Martin Luther King Jr. Yes. Yes. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about the MLK Coalition first. Right? Yeah. When did this start? 19 years ago? <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, in 1999, um, the church in Lemonster, um, Unitarian Church in Lemonster, decided that um, it was a, there was a need in this area to have, uh, to make recognition of Dr. King and his, um, you know, um, contributions to our, to our society. Uh, because pretty much, um, most of the um, programs, celebrations, were held in the larger cities, or the closest one, I think, Worcester being Worcester. So that was how it began. And it so actually the Lemonster Unitarian Universalist Church. Church, right. Correct. Down right in downtown. Yes. That, yes. And you got you are members there or uh, no, no. Actually uh, we didn't come on till a few years later. Because okay. the first year it was just a very small ceremony from what I understand. I wasn't a part of it then. They had a small ceremony at City Hall and um, to, you know, recognize Dr. King. And then one of the members and the minister said, you know, we our mission partly is, or in, in large part, is to connect with the younger generation and to pass on information about Dr. King. So let's get the schools involved and let's make this a larger program. So thus, over the years, it's grown. And um, initially, um, the three, as I said, Fitchburg, Lemonster, and Gardner school districts were involved. And students would write essays and do artwork and that type of thing. And the districts themselves um, contributed money to help us defray the expenses for the program. But over time, administrations changed and budgets and so forth. And so we've kind of lost the um, involvement from the school districts of the students. Uh, we have ha still had young people involved, but it tended to be groups, maybe um, uh, dance groups or things like that, just smaller, you know, community type um, organizations with young people involved uh, because we want to keep that connection. That's important to us to learn from them as well as they learn from us and learn about the civil rights movement. Yeah. So, so yeah. the MLK Coalition was started by the Lemster Unitarian Universalist yes. Church in 1999. Mm -hmm. All right, and it started as a small group and it's grown 
over the years. Correct. And when did you two get involved? When did you get involved, Linda and Tom? Well, I got involved, um, I think, was probably into the third year. Um, one of the members who knew me, you know, networked and, you know, informed me about the, the uh, existence of the group. And so I was happy to participate. And now, why, why so. you? What, so. what drives you to, to get involved? Well, I just think it's very important. I'm a retired teacher, and I know um, firsthand that, unfortunately, the civil rights movement and um, Martin Luther King, as well as uh, civil rights, many civil rights leaders, it's just kind of not taught in the schools. Mm -hmm. And students, it's kind of lost on students. And again, that's why the group was started by uh, a member of the uh, group at the time was a parent. Her young sons were in school and she was noticing that they weren't being taught that um, you know about the civil rights movement Dr. King so I really felt you know uh, I was glad to hear that a group like that existed and that we would be able to you know work together to pass on that information to Promote young it, people. Promote it, share yes. the information yeah. and, and make yeah. sure that the conversation keeps going. Yes mm -hmm. and so initially when I was teaching um, we used to have the students write essays and I would be involved in um, in my school particular building that I was in, having the students write writing essays and helping them to edit and do research and things like that. So I've really, you know, enjoyed that, enjoyed that aspect of it. Right. So. And when did you get involved, Tom? It was a couple of years afterwards. Uh, uh, Linda invited me to the event, and uh, so I attended the event a couple of years, and then. Um, eventually decided to, to join the, the committee because uh, I felt they did such a good job uh, reaching out to the community, telling them about uh, uh, diversity and uh, civil rights and uh, you know, equality for everyone and, and introducing it uh, to the schools. And, uh, and that was a good thing and at uh, Fitchburg and Lemerson and Garden, I think, uh, since we have a diversified population, it would be helpful. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And what is your background? I have a background and uh, I'm a retired uh, speech therapist. I worked in the Fitchburg Public Schools. Uh, for, so, uh, so teaching really is, is yeah. driving the, yeah. both of you. Yes. Okay. All right, and, and who else is involved in the MLK Coalition, and, and how can we find out more information about what you do, and, and if people are interested to volunteer their time and, and get involved? Uh, well, we have uh, Minister, the uh, Reverend uh, Susan Sahusky. She is still um, a member of our coalition. She just retired this past year um, from uh, the uh, ministerial position at the church. So uh, she's still teaching and doing some other things, but um, she's also, uh, she's the founder of the group, actually, so she's still involved. And then Paul uh, Luria, who's um, a retired teacher as well, a musician, um, you know, he's involved um, and coordinates our music as well. And then um, Gene uh, Farrell, who is um, with the Gardner School District, he's our Gardner contact person, and he's still, um, uh, he's an educator as well, he's a guidance counselor, and he's still actively involved in, uh, he's still employed, I and mean, he's not a retired person, so he's quite busy. Um, and then who else did we miss? Uh, let's see, oh, Mickey, uh, yeah. Mickey uh, 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 Guzman. Yeah, he's uh, also, um, he's a social worker. He's very known in the communities with the Spanish American, uh, Spanish American group. Yeah, in yeah. Lemonster. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, Spanish and he's yeah. A, um, a social worker, as I said. And um, he's also on the coalition, and he's also a musician. So we have some very uh, multi-talented people on the group, on the coalition. So, and on our poster, actually, we have a number uh, that you can call for if you um, would like further information about this event, but also if you are interested, if anyone is interested in becoming a part of, um, becoming a member of the coalition or just... Uh, call 978-537-0281. Yes. yes. And that's the best way to contact the coalition to find out more information. Yes. Yeah. Yes. All right. So great. We'd be happy to have um, people involved because we're, you know, constantly trying to expand and get new ideas and keep it fresh. And, and we'd like to have it as diverse as possible by, you know, age, gender, ethnicity, uh, you know, because we need those different perspectives. The diversity yes. is the strength, yes. really, is, exactly. is the whole point of the right. discussion. Exactly. Yeah. And what other groups do you work with other groups? Um, you know, uh, uh, the Lemonster, the Spanish American Center. Um, do you work with uh, the United Neighbors of Fitchburg? And, you know, um, I don't know. 
other community groups? Well, at present, um, not uh, uh, um, at present, but we have, uh, we had a partnership with the Mount Wachusett Community College um, some years back, uh, United Way was involved. So over you know, the course of years, we've, we've partnered with different groups. Um, but presently, we're kind of just uh, working <laughs> sort of on our own until we you know, further establish a few more um, connections. We have a smaller group now than we had as far as core members. We mm -hmm. had a larger membership. So that's one of the reasons why we need to expand our membership. So hopefully, we can expand our membership and then do even more outreach with other groups and organizations. So. Sounds yes. good. Yes. Okay, so that, well, let's talk about your, your celebration, the 19th annual. Right. Right? Now, uh, this year you're having, it's uh, at a lunchtime on Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Yes. And uh, it's from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m., and it's going to be at the Lemonster Unitarian Universalist Church. Correct. At, uh, what is it, 15 West Street in Fitchburg, uh, Lemonster. Yes. Right in downtown Lemonster at the Stone Church. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah? All right, so let's talk about what, you, what we're going to expect. Um, when we when we go, we, you buy tickets, and there is a catered lunch, and there's going to be speakers and music, and let's talk about that. Okay. Oh. Yeah, it, uh, you get tickets in advance. It's uh, only twelve dollars, and you get the uh, nice southern style uh, brunch with it. Uh, From Williams Southern from, Soul is uh, yes. catering. Yeah, we're huh? going to have a uh, chicken uh, uh, salad, uh, macaroni and cheese, and brownies, and. Uh, he's going to do a great job catering. and uh, does great mac and cheese. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, okay. Uh, and then the, there'll be a panel of uh, different individuals mm -hmm. that will uh, discuss their opinions of, of um, civil rights and, uh, and how it applies to, to their uh, experience. And, so we're uh, going to have a, a panel discussion yeah. on diversity and civil rights issues within our community and, and on a national level, perhaps? Yeah, if they if they each individual have their own way of doing it, and, uh, but that's the topics that they'll, they'll focus on. Yeah. Who who is going to be on our panel? All right, there was, there's uh, that Mickey Guzman is one of them, right? Mm -hmm. that, from the Spanish American Center. Then there was there's um, Roy, uh, individual Roy. Uh, I forget his last name. Uh, I, I know him. Yeah. Roy from uh, Clinton. He's going to address uh, veterans' issues in uh, equal rights. Mm -hmm. and, oh, yeah, uh, okay. Yeah, and then there's, um, let's see, who else was there? Reverend Susan. Yeah, Reverend Susan. Uh, so she'll do her viewpoint from a religious point of view and, and a social point of view. So the audience will get to listen to an interesting discussion between experts, really, in, in, our, in our local field. Yes, and then you'll have the opportunity to... Uh, for the uh, audience to question them. And, and we and, can ask questions? Yes. Okay, yeah. great. After they, they're going to give like a five minute speech on their personal experiences. And, uh, are there any specific important topics of, that are relevant today? Like, you know, there's been, a lot of, there's been a lot of concerns in the news and the media lately. Is there any specific topics that we're certain to address? Uh, yeah, I, I think they're going to focus a lot on the uh, with, uh, white supremacy and, and oh, things, yeah. things like the, that. The that, Nazi ism. Yeah, yeah. and uh, um, how it involved the uh, different uh, ethnic groups and, uh, and equality for all in America. Yeah, that, so that, yeah. All right. And so after your panel discussion, we, we're going to be able to talk, uh, break out groups? Yeah, and they'll have a chance to have their, uh, their brunch and then. Uh, ask the questions, and uh, then there's going to be uh, a little music after that. Music. Yes. Uh -huh. What? So what's? Who's going to be playing? What kind of music? All right. Uh, she just mentioned one of the members, Paul Lurie, is a, a Paul Lurie, yeah. very good musician, and he's going to play with his wife Paula, uh, and uh, they'll. Uh, let's see. He plays the guitar, the harmonica, and she plays the spoons and the singing. Oh, nice. Yeah. So it should should be very very good. Was there another music, uh, some other musician? Mickey may play with yeah, him as well. Yeah, yeah. Mickey Guzman. Mickey Guzman? Yeah, he yeah. might, uh, his whole family plays. And, oh, yeah? And, uh, with the uh, uh, Puerto Rican type drum music. And, uh, do, yeah. do, do you know his name of his band? Yeah. Sure. Um, it's a family band, yeah. and I forgot family the band. name of it now. Yeah, and as one of his sons uh, dances with, uh, 
he does, he does the uh, rap dancing with the. Oh, break dancing? Yeah, I just that, yeah, I think that's he did that one year. Right. I don't know right. if he'll do it again, but yeah, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. And Mickey plays the, the bongo drums there. So, yeah. music musical accompaniment. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it should be very good. Yeah. Okay, great. And let's see, what else do we have? And we have. Um, I see Congressman Jim McGovern is coming. Yes. Good. Is he speaking? Does he, is he um, speaking? Does he uh, have a speech? I see the mayors of Fitchburg and Lemonster are going to be there. Lemonster State Representative Natalie Higgins. Yeah. Other years, uh, uh, Senator McGovern did speak, and he usually speaks. You know, when we introduce him to everyone, and he'll uh, give a short uh, viewpoint on uh, the way things stand today with uh, racism and equality. And, and uh, particularly the yeah. hot issues that we have today. Yes. Yeah. 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 And right. uh, so they're each um, are mentioned here, and they're all welcome to um, greet and give a few remarks. And we hope that they do, because they always, as um, Tom said, they, it's always very enlightening. You know, that they share their perspective. You know, on a, a more global level. You know, community-wise, and then more globally as well. So. You know, it's, it's very, um, you know, enlightening and inspiring oftentimes. I mean, Congressman uh, McGovern is very, um, you know, he's very inspiring. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, yeah. it's always a joy and pleasure to hear him. And then our newest, uh, I guess the newest member um, of the state, state reps, Natalie Higgins, uh, she was, for the first time, um, she was newly elected last year, and she spoke, and it was wonderful. You know, it's, it's always nice, as I said, the younger to come in, give a different perspective. And um, you know, learn from that as well. So, She's a great speaker. Yeah. She, yes, she is. Yeah, very, very warm. So we're looking forward to her being there as well this year. So, yeah. Great. And so the actual physical getting the tickets. Um, do you, do you sell out on tickets? Should we buy early? Where do we buy tickets? And uh, where do we go specifically for the event? Uh, well, each of us are selling tickets, and then again, the number here. If anyone would like to call to, um, you know reserve a ticket, um, or make reservations, or ask questions. Uh, the number, again, on the poster is where they would call. 978-537-0281. And that's right there on your screen. There you can see it. Oh, so convenient. Yes. Right. And that's and then we call this number for tickets, Yes. for more information, right. to join the coalition. Yes. All, yeah. of, these, all of these things. Right. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Right. And we have um, at the event as well, it's not on the poster, we have books and uh, t-shirts as well. Um, we had a t-shirt that was made up some years back with a nice logo on it. Um, and uh, you know, it's, 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 it's an attractive shirt. I wish I had brought one so you could see it, but um, it's kind of, um, I don't want to say abstract kind of, but it's um, a if cool you look design. At it, yeah, it's a really neat design. So we have that. We have those available for sale. We have books. The books are on the civil rights movement. Some specifically on Dr. King. Um, I don't. I'm not recalling now if we have any because he authored a few books as well. But I know we have books about him. We have books in general about the civil rights movement. So those will be for sale as well. Um, and then during the program, I indicated here, uh, or it's indicated on the poster. Civil rights landmarks and losses of 2017 will be recognized. That's on this poster here. Mm -hmm. um, I started something uh, many years ago, a uh, little portion of the program where I devote to talking about in the past year, reflecting the past year on um, civil rights, uh, many civil rights leaders that are still alive today that, that are you know, passing on and their accomplishments and, you know, hopefully, hope hoping people will connect and understand how large a movement this was and how we're still very much connected to it today because you know in the past few years i mean some of these civil rights leaders that marched right alongside of dr king are just now passing away they're in their you know eight, late 80s early 90s you know um, but you know people can kind of young people can kind of get the scope that these you know young these civil rights leaders were on the same planet the same time they were so it wasn't something that happened hundreds and hundreds of years ago this is in, you know. in recent history exactly exactly so so I share that and then I share um, landmarks just anniversary dates of you know different marches and so uh, like a timeline of the civil yes, rights movement right, to today right, right exactly and, so and that's important that. to get perspective because right. people born today Really don't don't know that they don't know that history. Exactly. I mean, yeah. unless they unless they, exactly. they are taught it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Because they we have you know people born right now they they haven't been 
they haven't lived in that life where there was segregation. Right, right. right? And I, you know, I find each year, um, again, it's just a small segment of the program, but oftentimes people, you know, older people my age, whatever, will come up and say, wow, I didn't know that. I did little tidbits of information that I'll give. Um, you know, um, there was a song a few years ago that um, I spoke about uh, called Strange Fruit. Um, it's um, Billie Holiday, I believe. Billie Holiday sang it and made it famous, but a lot of people didn't know the history of that song. It was really about lynchings in the South. And people said, oh yeah, I you know, kind of briefly heard the title, but I didn't know Strange Fruit, what was that? Because that was in reference again to the lynchings. And so mm -hmm. I, I spoke a little bit, just a little bit about that and uh, people were really like surprised. They said, well, I guess I didn't really, you know, I didn't realize that there were a lot of things I don't know or that I hadn't, you know, um, learned about the civil rights movement or prior to the civil rights movement that, you know, the way things were in this country. So, yeah, so it's helpful. Yeah. Interesting. And so what, what else have you had in the past? Over 19 years, I'm sure you'd have, you'd have had different speakers and different, uh, if I heard break dancing. Yeah. What else, what else interesting things have happened in your celebrations? We had a lot of different uh, guest speakers, uh, like a key guest speaker. Um, there was a minister from uh, New York City, was it? Yeah, mm -hmm. Reverend uh, Perry. Perry, yeah, and he, he, did, he gave a, a speech like a, like a preacher from, from the pulpit, and, and uh, he, he did a great job, and then, yeah, then there was a question period afterwards, and so really just great, great speakers and great yeah. music. And yeah. then some years back, it reminds me as uh, Tom speaking, uh, uh, Reverend Timothy Martin, I believe he has a church here in Fitchburg or somewhere in the area now. Yeah. He uh, does uh, a reenactment of the dream, the I Have a Dream speech, and he does it in character. Oh, really? Very fiery rendition of that. And, does he uh, do that at your event? Or? He did that at our event one year oh, because wow. actually one of the members at the time um, told us about him because she had a connection or she has a connection um, in the Lemonster Public Schools and they had um, somehow, she, that was her job to be a liaison in the community and she had somehow tracked him down and he did uh, this dramatic I have a dream presentation to the students and she said he'd be wonderful so we were able to get him one year and he did that um, the I had to have a dream speech for us and he's done it many uh, for different many venues different venues in the area and as well I believe as I said he's still in the area and has his own church now that um, sounds great so yeah Reverend Reverend Timothy Martin so that was that. one of the more you know as you said, memorable, you know, right. events and because everyone has were... heard at least the first right. couple sentences of yes, that speech. Yes, 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 and uh, boy, that was something. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah. So that was one of the the more um, significant, uh, you know, um, components of our programs that we've had over the years. And as Tom said, we've had many speakers. Um, we've had uh, students uh, performing. Uh, dancing but also dramatic skits we had uh, a few times uh, we've had students that get up uh, that uh, would perform a sort of a drama like a little play um, around the um, the bus boycott movement oh, yeah. with civil Rosa with, uh, Parks, Martin, Rosa Parks. Uh, one year they did that um, you know poetry uh, recitation we had a, a woman who was a semi-professional poet she was she was very talented but she was wanting to get into that she came and she read some poetry of her own you know and it was really really powerful so we've had soloist um, of all ages we've had some you know grade school children who just have a very you know a gift for, for uh, singing and so we've had uh, we've had quite a quite a variety over the years and then of course we've had as I said when the schools were involved we had just um, like an art gallery of um, you know, um, different artwork from what kindergarten yeah. up through uh, you know high school, um, and uh, you know just different um, uh, what do I want to say interpretations of you know of uh, Dr. King's dream. You know what how students were perceiving it at that point and oh, an art what form, it meant to poetry them. Form. Yeah, yeah. So we had that spoken spoken word, dramatic art, singing, you know, movement. Yeah. <laughs> we tried to incorporate all of those. In, sounds like a great celebration. It. Yes, yes. So you so. want to come year after year. Yes. And is it uh, every year on uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day? Well, on or right about that. We, we've had it on a Sunday before. Or we've had it on, a, I'd say, a Sunday. We've had it on the day before sometimes. Um, we, we've tried to play around a little bit with the date just because we want as many people to be able to come. And um, 
the, uh, the, the situation with Sunday is that oftentimes people are in church and they felt, well, you know, um, can't give up uh, church on Sunday, so we kind of moved it to the, uh, the um, legal day of, right, the Monday. And so we've kind of, but typically it's been either the, you know, mon Sunday or Monday. But, um, and this year yeah. it's Monday, yes, it's January day, uh, 15th right. from yes. 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the Lemonster Uni Universalist Unitarian yes. Church. That's at 15 West Street in Lemonster. And uh, the cost is $12 in advance, $15 if you get to the door. And if you have an entire family, it's up to $45 for an entire family. Correct? Yes. Yes, and as I said, as I think it says on here, uh, wrestling with racism, uh, diversity in a time of adversity, that's our um, sort of uh, theme or topic uh, this year. And I know one of our members, he uh, said, uh, I think on the ticket it might say that, it says, come wrestle with racism. Because one of the things that we thought about this year, we've had speakers and we've had some wonderful speakers over the years, but um, we, you know, as you said, there are so many issues, so many things going on. We noticed that when we've had speakers and we've had a little bit of time um, allotted to um, table discussions afterwards, people would really get into it. Mm. So we thought, wow, more and more, and there's so many issues, which one do you choose or however? So we thought having a panel just, you know, introduce a few of these, you know, really hot kind of uh, topics um, and give their take on it would get like people. Like white supremacy. Right, right. Uh, you know, white supremacy and so forth and white privilege and all of that and kind of get people, you know, Black Lives Matter. Into, yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, get people, you know, um, into a, a discussion on these things that, that that we could give more time to that because people seem to really have a need to, you know, engage in conversation and and um, dialogue about these topics. Well, yeah, so. I mean, whenever right. anyone shares a Black Lives Matter issue on right. social media, it immediately gets into an argument on all lives matter. And it's like you don't understand what Black Lives Matter mean. Well, we, well, I don't think that you know that right. it's, uh, and. and and it seems like the the whole complex it, it turns it into a very complex issue, whereas right, it's, right. it's really actually a simple issue, right? Um, the the idea of you know the what the white privilege and right. and you know that that black that blacks are targeted, you know, on a more higher level than than white. Right. right. Well, I think that people, that's why I think people need to dialogue about it because I think people have just what's in their head and then that's why they tend to get very emotional over it because they have just one understanding of this in their head and they don't dialogue with people who, um, you know, are experiencing it or have a different perspective and they just, you know, kind of sit with what's in their head and then, as you said, when it comes out, it's, you know, they don't have the opportunity, which we're trying to provide with for people a, to dialogue. An actual physical and, yeah, discussion. And say, yeah. you know, hear me out. This is what, where I'm coming from, you know, and then, you know, give food or, you know, give the person pause for thought to say, oh, okay, I hadn't thought of it that way, that kind of thing. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's rare. It, it doesn't, maybe does seems like it shouldn't be, but it is rare for, for a forum or, or um, a venue as, such as this to sit down and actually be able to dialogue about these, encourage it, you know, encourage the dialogue. And it's, it's, so, it's so powerful and it's so important. Right, right. Yeah, because when yeah. you have these discussions with actual people, then you can start to to start to shift your, your thought patterns. Right. Right? Right. Yeah, yeah. so this is great. All right. Mm -hmm. So we have a couple minutes left. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the important points that you'd like to get out about this uh, celebration, which is Monday, January 15th, at the First Church Unitarian Universalist in Lemonster, 11 a.m.? Correct. What are the uh, important points you'd like to get out? Besides, everyone should attend. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, just that, uh, you know, you're going to have a good time. You're, you're gonna, uh, There's going to so, be food from William Southern Soul. Yeah, yeah. There's going to be music. Yeah. There's going to be interesting dialogue. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, and great people. Yes. Yeah. yes. I think we forgot uh, that Adrian Ford is going to be on. And, uh, oh, yes. Right. You yes. are giving an award to Adrian yeah. Ford. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. he's been very active. He's at Three, three Pyramids. Is that correct? Yep. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yes, he's a longtime uh, activist in the area and, uh, you know, is uh, very well known in the area, but really done a lot, you know, and a lot of uh, people, uh, Adrian Ford, obviously this year, but, you know, kind of just have gone about doing these things, just taking these roles on. And we want to recognize them because it's really important, you know, um, especially to encourage the younger generation to, you know, sort of 
take up the torch and, and continue on we the work. We need more people to get so, involved. Yes, yeah. to continue the work. So we're really looking forward to having him. He, as well, uh, is receiving the award. He's going to participate, too, was in, in the, uh, in the, the panel. discussion? Yes, oh, so great. that should be very, yeah. very That'll interesting and enlightening as well. Well, thank you so much, guys, for thank coming you. on. Uh, members of our uh, MLK Coalition, you're the co-chair, Linda yes. Mason, Tom <laughs> Ferrazano, a member. Yeah. All right, and so uh, the celebration again, Monday, January 15th. Hope to see everyone there. I'm going to try to make it. I mean, it'll be a, a good lunch, good yes. lunch break. Yes. No? 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. And for more information, you can go to mlkcoalition.org. So, Is that right? Well, we don't have, we don't quite have that together, but call the number. So, you want to yes. buy a ticket for me?